In the next 30 minutes, we're going to spend time in scripture and song and prayer, considering what it means to say that the way of Christ is boundary breaking. What does it mean to say that Christ broke boundaries or breaks boundaries? And are we called to do the same? And you know what? If you are joining us through Facebook this morning, I want to encourage you to take just a moment right now to like and share the worship feed. Someone in your circle of influence is looking for a word of hope this morning, and this just might be the thing that they need. This is a small and yet powerful way to spread the word of hope in our world. If you have a Bible um, with you at home and want to, you can open up to the Gospel of Luke chapter 19. That's where we'll be continuing in this sermon series this morning. The way of Christ is boundary breaking today as we consider the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. So this is the Gospel of Luke chapter 19 beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 10. Hear these words. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him but because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Because he too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek out and to save the lost. Let us pray. Holy and almighty God, we give thanks this morning for our scripture, for your Holy Spirit's presence with us. How we pray that our hearts and our minds and our ears might be open to hear the message that you have crafted for each of us this morning. God, I pray that these words would be your words. This message, a demonstration of your spirit's power and nothing of my own. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Jesus is boundary breaking. In the story with him and Zacchaeus, he's breaking all sorts of social boundaries. And so when we talk about the way of Christ being boundary breaking, we're not talking about not holding healthy boundaries. We certainly don't want to allow people to take advantage of us, to walk all over us. We don't want to break boundaries that are safety boundaries for us. What we're talking about is how Jesus, when he walked in his earthly life and how Christ through us, the church continues to call us to break boundaries that humanity sets up for ourselves to divide us up, to isolate one or a group of people, to make us disunified. Christ is boundary breaking because he crosses or breaks boundaries that we create to divide ourselves as God's people. And so before we can understand how Jesus is breaking those kinds of boundaries in the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus, we have to understand Zacchaeus's place in his community. What does it mean to say that Zacchaeus is the chief tax collector? It's tax season for us right now. We understand what it means to pay our taxes. We understand what the IRS is as the tax collector of our day. But what was that in Zacchaeus' time? This is when the Roman Empire was occupying the Jewish land. And so what they would do is they would come in, they would take over a place, and then they would require the people where they were occupying their land that they had overtaken to pay taxes to the Roman government. And the way they would collect those is they would employ people from the community. So Zacchaeus 
is a Jewish man living in the Jewish community that's being occupied by Rome, and he's been employed by Rome to collect the taxes from the people who live in his area. And what would often happen is these tax collectors, now seen as aligned with the oppressor, the Roman Empire, they would not only collect the taxes for the Roman Empire, but they would take extra. And the Roman government was happy for them to do that, as long as they were getting the money that they required. They were happy for the tax collectors to put an even greater burden on the people of their community, and they would keep that money for themselves. And so when the people grumble at Jesus' engagement with Zacchaeus and other tax collectors that we read about earlier in the Gospel of Luke or even in the Gospel of Matthew as a tax collector is called as a disciple, they grumble because for the people, this is a person that they see as aligned with this government that's oppressing them, that this is a person who takes extra, that lives on greed. They were not welcome in their community, but they also weren't really Roman. So they weren't really welcome there either. They lived in this liminal space, the tax collectors. And so what we see in this story is this person, the chief tax collector, the head of tax collectors in his area, he scurries up a tree just to get a glimpse of this rabbi Jesus he's heard about. And Jesus, as he often does, as we have seen throughout this season of Lent in our other stories, Jesus sees Zacchaeus. And he stops. He allows an interruption. And he calls him down from the tree. And he says, I'm coming to your house today for dinner. And the people grumble because he's a tax collector. And we all know what that means. So the typical way that we read the Zacchaeus story, the one that's uh, most uh, widely preached, is that Zacchaeus has this encounter with Jesus. They go to his home. They have a meal. And in some course of that, Zacchaeus becomes repentant for what he's done in his community, for the way he maybe has exercised his power to create additional burden and oppression of the people around him. And so he has this moment where he sort of makes this repentant confession, says, I'm going to turn away from that. I will give back what I've taken, and I will repay four times as much Anybody that I have taken extra from, and I give half of, I will give half of everything I have to the poor. And so we see this sort of turn and this redemption moment, and Jesus pronounces him saved. And so in this case, Jesus breaks the human made boundaries of judgment. The people grumble because Jesus is giving this sinner, this tax collector, opportunity for mercy and grace. But what we know is that Jesus has always called us to rejoice at redemption. And this is no different. When the woman loses her coins in the story not too long before this, she rejoices when they're found. And then the prodigal son comes home and we learn that all of heaven rejoices together when a repentant sinner turns and finds redemption. And so we are called to rejoice at another's redemption. So Jesus breaks his human-made boundary of judgment. He says, you don't get to decide who's in and who's out. You don't get to decide who God's mercy is for, who has done enough to earn it. But when someone experiences redemption, rejoice. This is hard for us. I don't know about you, but I am often like the crowd, grumbling. You know, we want revenge a lot of times. We want to see somebody that has caused suffering to suffer. And yet, Jesus calls Zacchaeus down from the tree and says, I'm coming to your house for dinner. 
And you too get a chance at mercy and grace. You too get a chance to be different. You know, the Lenten book study and Bible study that I'm leading about the book of longings by Sue Monk Kidd, just this last week we read a section and there's this moment where this woman, that's the main character of the story, says this about Jesus. She says, his capacity for mercy baffles me. And I think that's what happens in this moment with the crowd in Zacchaeus. It's what happens so often in the gospel stories. It's what happens for me. The capacity for mercy that our God has sometimes baffles me. And yet, I'm called to rejoice at another's redemption. But what if I told you that Zacchaeus' story can not only be read as a redemption story, but it can also be read so that Zacchaeus is already doing these good things before he ever encounters Jesus from the tree. There's this place in the text toward the end in verse 8 where Zacchaeus has come down from the tree. They've gone to his house for dinner. They've come back out or so we can assume that this conversation happens in front of some people. And Zacchaeus says, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, is how the NRSV translates it. I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. But what if I told you that the Greek that's behind that is ambiguous? It's in a present tense indicative. What that means is you could translate it like this. I have had this encounter with Jesus I have turned away from the way I was living, and now this is what I'm going to do. I am going to give to the poor half of what I have. I am going to give back four times as much as I've taken. I will do these things now because of what's happened. That's one way to read it, but you can also read this and translate it as the common English Bible does, as a, this is what I'm already doing. This is just what I do. As Zacchaeus' moment to stand in front of his community and say, you have made assumptions about me because of my job. And they're not true. Because this could be translated. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I give to the poor. I give away half of what I have, half of what I earn. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I pay back four times as much. Anytime I take something more than I was supposed to, I give back four times as much. I repent and repay. And so what if Zacchaeus is not the sinful tax collector shamed by his community righteously for greed and corruption? What if he is a person born into a place in society where he ends in this job, ends in this place, and he's just trying to do the best he can with what he has. He's trying to live as faithfully as he can, and yet he's being isolated and pushed aside by his community because of his title and because of his work. What if this is a moment where Jesus saw who Zacchaeus was in a way his community couldn't because they had never given him the chance This is the implication of changing the way we interpret the verb tense. And this also reminded me of something that happened in my Lenten study over the last few weeks. As we've read this book, we've been able to see some of the historical setting and understand a little bit more clearly how people lived in the time of Jesus' earthly life. And I was reminded both through the book and through the conversation with some of the ladies in the class That in this time, like birth, place, and order, and family matter deeply. You were born into the life you would have. And there was not a lot of movement up or down any kind of social or professional ladders. The main character of that book, Anna, is the daughter 
of a chief tax collector. And she is not well received by her community because of her father's work. And he happens to be the kind that is corrupt. But imagine being born into that household with not a lot of way to get out of it, especially as a male, he would have been born into that line of work, locked into this identity as tax collector's son, and then eventually chief tax collector. And here he is just trying to live his life as faithfully as he can as a Jewish man, giving away half of what he has, repaying back anytime he finds out that he's taken more than was his to have, four times as much, and yet still being isolated, shamed, boundaried by his community. Until Jesus comes along and says, come down out of that tree, Zacchaeus. Jesus breaks the human-made boundary of assumptions and calls us to see people for who they are. Not the labels they've been given by society. So the good news is either way we look at the story... Whether Zacchaeus is this sinful tax collector in need of redemption who then receives it, or if Zacchaeus is this misunderstood tax collector, we learn from the crowd. Because no matter which way we read Zacchaeus' story, the crowd is the same. They grumble that Jesus dare go to his house for dinner. We have a propensity to grumble, to judge people that we think aren't worthy of mercy or grace or love, or to make assumptions about people for who we think they are based on what we can see. And then we grumble. We grumble that God would dare go to their house for dinner or that that friend of ours would dare entertain that person's company. We have a propensity to grumble and it breaks our peace and joy. And so Jesus says, break those boundaries. Break those boundaries of judgment and assumption. Stop grumbling and instead find peace and joy. Be able to rejoice at another's redemption. Be able to have peace about who is engaging who in community because you're not making assumptions. Have peace about who gets what? You know, which is the true story? I think it's ambiguous on purpose. I think the writer of the Gospel of Luke left these verbs ambiguous on purpose because he wanted us to see ourselves in the story in whichever way worked for us. Are we the crowd grumbling at someone's redemption or the crowd grumbling because of an assumption? But ultimately, the message is the same. Cross the boundaries. Break the boundaries that divide us, judgment and assumption. And find the peace and joy of Christ when we do. In Zacchaeus' story, Jesus asks us to stop deciding who's in and who's out. Not our place. We don't get to decide who's in or who's out. To stop begrudging those who find redemption. And in the place of all those boundaries we've created to divide ourselves, we just might find the peace and joy of Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Courtney. Friends, we come before God each and every week in prayer. So let us do that this morning. Will you bow with me? Holy, gracious, and loving God, we come to you today to better understand how we are to treat one another how we are to see ourselves, how we are to walk through this world, to be people of love and not judgment. God, we are reminded today that Zacchaeus was judged for who he was, what he did for a living, not who God created him to be. God, help us not to judge others by what they do, the color of their skin, where they live, their political beliefs, but to love our neighbors and to even love our enemies. God, you model that for us in Scripture each and every time we pick up our Bible. And yet it is so much easier to reach for judgment, to reach for hate, to reach for condemnation, 
or to reach for condescension or ignore something, to turn a blind eye. God, you call us to look straight at the pain of this world, to stand up against injustice, and to reach out and comfort those who are mourning. So God, this morning we pray for those who were murdered in the Atlanta shootings. God, help our country, heal our country as we struggle with violence, mental health, and racism. We have so much anger and pain, and we need healing and resurrection. We don't need to be right. We don't need to prove someone wrong. God, give us the courage and humility to cross these boundaries just as Christ did, to reach out to another human being in love, to reach for hope, understanding, and resurrection. God, we give you thanks for the vaccines that are making their way around our world to help end this horrible pandemic. But we continue to pray for those who are grieving so much loss from this pandemic. Loss of role, loss of sanity, loss of job, and loss of life. God, we pray for all those especially who have lost loved ones. God, we pray for the church as we are about to enter Holy Week next week. May the church be a sanctuary for people. May there be a stirring within those who maybe haven't been to church in a while to walk through the doors, to sing Hosanna next Sunday, to come to the table on Thursday, to sit with Christ in the pain of crucifixion on Friday, to sit in that waiting space of Saturday, and to taste the sweet joy of resurrection on Easter morning. God, may the church be a place of comfort and hope for those enduring pain, loss, and depression. God, we feel stuck in this liminal space. We are almost out of the pandemic, but not yet. It feels like it's almost over, but not quite. It sort of feels like that Saturday between crucifixion and resurrection. The pain of crucifixion is past, but we're not quite to the resurrection of Easter Sunday. So God, help us in this middle time, this incomplete time, this almost time, this waiting space that can be so frustrating and so immensely painful for those who are and will lose loved ones here so close to the end of this global pandemic. God, help us in the waiting. Help us to love ourselves and our neighbors and keep us strong as we walk day in and day out. Lord, we need your help and we need your comfort. And so we pray all these things in your name using the words that you taught us. As we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.